this lesson is going to be about the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age is going to cover, oh, anywhere from the years 1877 to around 1901. And you can extend it into 1910 if you want to uh, include the uh, progressive era and populism. Uh, this will uh, this will be with that goes with uh, your reading for chapters 17 and even parts of 18. But it does not take the place of, uh, of what you need to get as far as the details. So this is going to be a general overview. And there's a lot of things to consider when you talk about the Gilded Age. Um, you know, something to think about while, while you're reading and watching this. Evaluate the extent of the causes of acquisition of power and wealth of the Gilded Age capitalists. As we look upon this era, it's going to be, it's going to be more uh, powerful to become a major entrepreneur during that time period rather than president of the United States. So the Gilded Age is going to come from, um, coin the, uh, Mark Twain is going to coin the phrase from his book, A Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, uh, which was a novel by Mark Twain, and it kind of uh, defined the years uh, after the Civil War. Like I've told you before, uh, if you take a golden apple and it's nice and shiny on the outside, it's still full of rot and corruption if you were to take a bite. Uh, you'll see a lot of prosperity during this uh, time period, a lot of growth in industry and technology, but at the, at the same time, you're going to see a lot of people that are going to take advantage of the situation. So if we were to kind of talk about the Gilded Age, Gilded Age I want you to think about the word buildings. And buildings, is it, it applies here because this is the age of the skyscraper when cities are going to begin to uh, grow not only outward but also upward as well. And so I've created the acronym buildings so that you can kind of uh, – to kind of associate different things with uh, with the Gilded Age. So if you ever see something that's um, on an essay, uh, you can always uh, jump into different topics. So for example, the B in buildings is for big business. And this is your uh, where you've got to uh, distinguish between your captains of industries or your uh, robber barons. The U is for urbanization and uh, the growth of the cities and how immigrants are going to flock to cities looking for work. And it also be, kind of becomes... Um, uh, the what's happening in, in the United States. A lot of trade, a lot of manufacturing uh, coming from major cities, especially in the Northeast. The I is for immigration. Now you have your new group of immigrants that are going to move into the United States from Southern Europe, from Eastern Europe, and from Asia. Uh, the Eastern Europeans are going to get processed through Ellis Island, where Asians are going to get processed in Angel Island out of San Francisco. And so there's a lot of stories and a lot of different perspectives as far as uh, coming into the country, but then also looking for or work and uh, and people that are, are just like them. Uh, this also is a time period where workers are going to begin to protest and to uh, speak out for better working conditions and better pay. And so how are these major entrepreneurs that hold uh, ownership of these companies, how are they going to respond to uh, those uh, laborers? Um, this is also some period that uh, for depression. So one of the one of the things that's consistent throughout our history is the economic rise and fall uh, of our economy, and a lot of it's because we promote laissez-faire politics and competition. Uh, and in the long run, long run, that's a good thing. But every now and then, uh, our economy does dip. And so, how does the government respond uh, to those economic downturns? The I is for uh, Indian Wars, which we discussed in uh, Chapter 16. And your uh, video on uh, settlement of the West is the interaction between the Native Americans and the uh, and the American government, along with industries such as mining, ranching, and um, and farming. Uh, the New South after the Civil War, the uh, South is going to have to reinvent itself. Uh, they're going to increase industrialization. They're going to promote education. Uh, however, in the end, you still have Southern Democrats that are going to be in control of those of those places. Uh, the Grangers, uh, I won't cover it in this video, but the next video should cover uh, the plight of the farmers because they were the ones that were kind of left out as far as advancement and how they're going to um, how they're going to uh, organize and form uh, their own political party, and they're going to reshape the Democratic Party in 1896 as well. And then finally, the uh, the question of whether or not silver should be part of the uh, of the monetary system. Our money was back with gold at this time. Farmers are going to clamor for silver to be a part of that. And so, should we be a uh, should we have a money that is backed by both gold and silver?
So if we were going to describe the political, uh, the Gilded Age, how would we describe it? Well, we call it com- political uh, conservatism. So during this age of industrialization, and just to kind of read you a summary of economic change in the 1890s, you know, during the late 19th century, the U.S. economy grew at its fastest rate in American history. It was the fastest growth in manufacturing, and it grew by almost over 200%. The railroad system did play a big role in the economy, and the power of the railroads was an unfair uh, as an unfair way it was used led to one of the first federal attempts to regulate business. So one of the things that we need to know is that a lot of railroad owners are going to take advantage of charging prices to certain people for uh, transporting your growth. Those farmers that can't already afford a whole lot because of uh, they're not making a lot of money, they're going to get take, get take advantage of them. And so the Interstate Commerce Act is going to, uh, is going to be, uh, something that's going to be created to kind of govern the uh, railroads. Uh, In the growing urban society, labor was a commodity to be bought and sold, and workers had little independence and status. Worker dissatisfaction led to labor, national labor organizations, and produced labor radicalism, sometimes resulting in violence. The situation was uh, exasperated by the severe four-year depression beginning in 1893. Uh, To wealthy Americans, labor protests seemed to be a threat to social order. Uh, To lower-class Americans, the power wielded by new business leaders made uh, such violence inevitable. In the election of 1896, it marked a crucial turning point in American political history and changed the politics of the previous 20 years. The Democratic Party adopted many issues that uh, favored many uh, discontented farmers from the West and the South, and they nominated a guy by the name of William Jennings Bryan for president. Bryan is going to launch an unprecedented whistle-stop campaign and was challenged by his Republican opponent, William McKinley. Now, this is in 1896, who waged a front porch campaign and won the votes of the American urban Americans. McKinley's going to win the election and the economy pulled out of the depression and the U.S. is going to enter a long period of growth. The nation seemed prosperous, but below the surface there's many urging reforms. The biggest shift in power in America has seen, been through the increasing size and wealth of large businesses and owners like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, J.P. Morgan, amongst others. Uh, There was an increasing sense of class inequality, and general business leaders could not show concern, did not show concern for the rights of the workers and the general public. Government efforts to legislate control over big businesses were weak and not supported by labor labor rights advocates. The working class began to feel that their rights of liberty and equality were being ignored, which began urban violence. Labor problems along the uh, failing economic climate for Western and Southern farmers led to an increased organization known as the Populist Party. And this is where uh, chapter 18, this is where you'll get into into chapter 18 and the redevelopment of the Democratic Party. Uh, Liberty, equality, and power did not seem within the reach of the ordinary American at this point in history. And so while the rich are getting rich, the poor are getting poorer. And so if you look at kind of the characteristics of this time period, you could say that when it came to politics, things are going to be status quo. Not a whole lot of change, not until really until uh, imperialism hits in, in, in the 1900s. Uh, big business is going to rule. The uh, the titans of industry, as they, as they were called, are going to kind of rule, uh, are going to uh, have a lot of uh, government uh, influence as, as well. And of course, laissez-faire which means government uh, government has their hands out of it. We can create our own business as we see fit. So three things to think about when you're thinking about the Gilded Age. Uh, laissez-faire versus government expansion, economic and political corruption, and the formation of modern political and economic norms. Um, and so as we, get into, as we get into kind of the characteristics of the Gilded Age, the things to consider. Number one, political leadership was not outstanding. Since the death of Lincoln, there wasn't really a president that really grabbed a hold of the nation's character until Theodore Roosevelt. So we're going to go through some of the presidents during the Gilded Age, and you're going to notice that their leadership is not, uh, not very strong. Uh, they didn't want to address the national problems caused by rapid social and economic changes of the time. So few, very few issues were discussed. Politicians took few chances. They wanted no risk, no changes, and presidents were generally subordinate to congressional superiority, uh, with the exception of Rutherford B. Hayes, who ended Reconstruction, and Grover Cleveland. 
Uh, both major parties supported big business and laissez-faire. There was no forms of federal assistance for retired veterans' pensions. And that won't uh, change until Theodore, uh, I'm sorry, Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes president in uh, 1832. The Republican Party will be elected, will elect every president but Grover Cleveland in 1884 to 1892. So the Republicans are going to hold a very strong, uh, they're going to hold very strong politically uh, throughout this era. Uh, but the elections were very close in popular vote. And uh, both houses of Congress were controlled by the same party only twice. So any time that that happens, uh, Congress and, and the presidency is going to enter a lot of gridlock. Uh, both presidential parties were regional, made up of the three factions. They were stalwarts, half-breeds, and mugwumps. So even in the Republican Party, they were split off into kind of the three groups. Your stalwarts are your conservative Republicans who favor the old issues of the South whereas the half-breeds were liberal Republicans that favored the new issues of the South. Uh, party bosses are going to control the political parties. Uh, party bosses like James Blaine, Roscoe Conkling, uh, Senator Zachariah Chandler of Michigan, um, Senator uh, Logan of Illinois, uh, count, courted personal loyalty and stressed the spoil system. Um, a new type of reformer developed during this period, This was these were mugwumps, who were liberal on social issues, but conservative on economic issues, which means they were for uh, laissez-faire, they were for a lower tariff, and they were for sound money, uh, hard money in your hand. Um, Americans engaged in political activity for regional, ethnic, and, and religious sentiments. And we'll really touch on that when we get to uh, the progressive movement. So here's kind of how the United States looks. Uh, you can see where the larger cities are located up into the uh, northeast. You can also see that's where that's where mainly most of the manufacturing is taking place. You can see off to the west, there uh, there's a big, a lot of mining industry. And also you're going to see petroleum also uh, all, petroleum during this time period is also going to be created uh, in Lucas, uh, Oh, Lucas Oil uh, is going to be created. Then, of course, Spindle Top in 1901. And you can see Texas has a lot of oil there. So, you know, petroleum is a hot industry here in the uh, state of Texas. All right. So just talking about some of the things regarding the Industrial Revolution, um, three reasons for America's quick success in industrialization um, after the Civil War. There was an incentive of a democratic government and our and our free laissez-faire uh uh, capitalistic economic system. So there was a lot of incentives to make money there. We found value, value and plentiful raw materials and the character of the American people. That was our most valuable natural resource. We were, we were willing to go West. We were willing to, uh, you know, be creative in, in our, uh, in our discoveries. And we had a lot of success with that and made a lot of money in doing so. So when you think of major, you know, major inventions, of course, like the railroad is going to continue to, uh, evolve into uh, into being more uh, productive in the West. Uh, you know, the, some of the big changes in the railroads are things like mileage, how it's going to increase in all parts of the United States, and companies are going to be encouraged to build railroads. A lot of railroad owners are going to make a lot of money uh, in doing that. People like Cornelius Vanderbilt, James Hill, uh, Leland Sanford are going to recruit uh, professionals who are going to become managers of those places. Uh, improvements in, in the speed of the railroad, the comfort in railroads and safety. So you're going to see more and more people even travel uh, through the way of the railroad. They use uh, coal, diesel, um, electric trains, gas turbine trains. Uh, of course, with the invention of steel uh, through the Bessemer Kelly process, steel rails, wooden ties, uh, created a more standardized uh, track gauge, uh, multiple tracks with block switches and automatic uh, couplers, so they were interacting with each other. The air brake was invented in 1869. Uh, the telegraph is going to be invented in 1844, and those telegraph lines are going to run along the uh, along the uh, along the railroads. And then, of course, the Pullman cars, which are more luxurious uh, cars as well. The Transcontinental Railroad was uh, finished in 1869. It's going to encourage individualism by allowing immigrants, settlers to go west, live live and work there, look for natural resources, and they're going to bring those things back east. The most notorious of the uh, railroads are going to be Cornelius Vanderbilt's uh, Union Pacific Railroad. But if you look on the uh, if you look on the uh, on the PowerPoint here, you notice that one of the also one of the biggest inventions is, of course, the electricity. Uh, controversy as to who gets credit for the creation of the of the of the light bulb, whether it's Nikola Tesla, Tesla using his AC current or Thomas Edison. Uh, Thomas Edison will become one of our most uh, 
uh, important inventors. He invents more than just the uh, light bulb. He'll invent, he'll invent things like the phonograph, uh, amongst uh, amongst other things. Uh, let's see if I have any more on um, on Edison. Uh, he invents the indicus indicus Condescent light bulb in uh, 1880. Uh, he also is going to invent uh, the dynamo. He'll open the first central power plant in New York City in 1882. Um, he, along with Tesla's invention of the alternating current motor, uh, they'll develop a transformer using that. And so uh, they'll create general electricity in uh, Massachusetts. So it was a called Stanley Electric, but then, of course, today uh, we know it as General Electric or uh, GE, which will open the door for things like uh, nuclear power uh, into the uh, future. So if you look at this, you can see all the different uh, innovations that occurred during the uh, uh, during the Gilded Age, uh, some of the more notorious ones, the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, you, you should be able to know the kind of the evolution of the uh, telephone into the uh, cell phone, of course, today. Uh, the Model T car in 1908, as you, you start to see motorized uh, carriages take place as we turn, turn the century. We've talked about barbed wire and how that closed the open range. Levi Strauss and the blue jeans for a more durable jean for uh, people that are working in, uh, in gold mining. Uh, the the air brakes, of course, helps the uh, helps uh, the railroads, and so all kinds of different little uh, innovations that that have occurred uh, over the years. Um, some of the monumental innovation also that occurs, things like Dr. Pepper and, uh, you know, and, and cola drinks, Coca-Cola, of course, out of, the, out of Atlanta um, are also some of the more innovations. You can see the number of patents. A patent is a uh, license uh, invention. When you create an invention, make sure you get licensed by the U.S. Patent Office, and that patent is yours. Nobody can copy it and make money uh, off of it. Uh, people are going to start to move towards uh, scientific management known as uh, Taylor. Uh, where people, you know, in the past, the companies have always had a kind of a uh, the owner to worker kind of relationship. But as businesses get bigger, that relationship between the owner and the workers is going to dwindle and people start buying uh, or people start hiring people that are managers. And those managers uh, are the ones that are going to uh, kind of oversee the production and make sure people are meeting their their quotas and such. And so, no longer do you have that relationship between the owner and the and the workers. Now there are uh, people that are going to uh, plan schedules, train, supervise. Uh, they plan the work. The workers work the plan, um, and so uh, pay is often uh, usually based on uh, results. And so as mass production begins to enter the United States, you think about the assembly line, uh, which will lead to the uh, the things like the Model T car, which will be uh, created on the assembly line. The benefits of the assembly line is it makes products cheaper. It also makes more products, which will end up dro uh, dropping the cost. All right. So this is going to take us to... Um, the new businesses that are formed, uh, the four guys that you see there are kind of the four entrepreneurs uh, that are kind of case studies for American innovation. Cornelius Vanderbilt, who began as a owner of a, a steamship corporation, is going to jump over to railroads. Andrew Carnegie and the Steel Corporation, a rags to riches uh, story. John D. Rockefeller and uh, Standard Oil, and then of course J.P. Morgan in the banking industry, who will later uh, buy the U.S. Steel Corporation from Andrew Carnegie and will become the richest man in the world. So rich that he'll actually him himself with his gold will bail out the United States economy in the Depression of I believe eighteen. Uh, 93. But before the Civil War, businesses typically were proprietorships, businesses that were owned by one person or family. Another uh, word for it would be like a cottage industry where, um, you know, people do it under their own homes. <laughs> There's very limited capital in that. Uh, partnerships where two or more people had joint ownership of the of the of uh, of a business, some of the advantages, familiar, familiar, familiarity, uh, more capital, some of the disadvantages, limited liability, no perpetual life, it didn't last forever, and you had to share the profits. So now we're going to enter an age after the Civil War where the new U.S. businesses were created, and they were called corporations, where three or more people are going to apply to the state government for a charter or license to sell sh stocks or ownership in the corporation. Typically, a board of directors is set up to make business decisions for the corporation. 
the corporate name uh, may be placed in New York or the American Stock Exchange to allow brokers to do actual buying and selling of stock in a large way. Uh, some of the advantages, you have an unequal, unlimited capital, perpetual life, limited liability. Owners don't have to work. Uh, it's good to be your own boss. Quarter to quarterly d- dividends, and they can sell ownerships at any time to that find a buyer. And so these consolidations of these corporations can be broken up into pools, which are gentlemen agreements among business rivals to fix prices or divide markets for profits. It was popular in 1870s. Remember, there is no such thing as unlimited as monopolies were allowed during this time. There were no laws that were passed yet that would limit uh, uh, monopolies. Uh, there are also trusts where the principal stockholder and several similar corporations reach an agreement to run their corporations as one giant business. This was developed by Rockefeller in 1882 to replace competition with cooperation. Some of the advantage, you made a ton of money, saved competition on cost. Some of the disadvantages, higher consumer costs, and it destroyed competing businesses. All right. So as we take a look at these guys, uh, when we look at capitalism as a whole, all right, they're the free enterprise system that we live by today. Uh, there are several pillars that kind of governs that private enterprise ship, which gives people the opportunity to create their own businesses if they so desire. Of course, under American law, uh, cap, uh, competition uh, amongst two companies, which helps drive the prices down the right to private property, the right to profit motive, and of course, uh, consumer sovereignty, where they have the choice whether or not to buy in your your, uh, company or not. They have the choice to to buy your product or not to buy your product. So some of these captains of industry to Robert Barons, and the reason why we just find them this way is some historians are going to look at these guys as they were innovators in, in a time where there was no really no law to govern them. And so they made millions and millions of dollars. They kind of paved the way for f- people in the f- in the future to kind of follow the same uh, script. Whereas uh, there are other historians that believe that they took advantage of the system, took advantage of the poor, because remember, uh, there are workers that are working for them. They never advanced financially. The rich remain rich and the poor remain poor. And so there was a failure to reach that connection between the, the uh, rich and the poor. And so they were seen as robber barons where they took advantage of the situation. Um, you know, we've already kind of talked about the railroads, but we talked about, uh, you know, as P- as uh, railroad companies acquired land, they often um, would purchase it in a, uh, they wouldn't do it in a straight line. You know, the quickest way between two points is a straight line. Well, when you buy railroads and you buy land, you want to curve the railroads so they can acquire more land. Well, what are you going to do with that land? Well, of course, you're setting up businesses along that area and, uh, and a longer mileage that people would have to pay on. But there were a lot of problems with the railroads. They, were, they weren't regulated, uh, of course. Uh, they were different according to time zones. And a lot of accidents would occur because you had two railroad are two trains that were on the same track. So they had to regulate it. And this is where the Interstate Commerce Act comes into commission, uh, where they basically set a complete um, a price for the railroad uh, for to use the railroad. Uh, and then also they had to schedule the times for uh, when when trains were on the track and things like that. But it became a, it became a b- booming uh, business for Cornelius Vanderbilt and they, it was considered one of the richest men in America during that time. And you can see, you can notice the patterns uh, of the railroads weren't always straight. They were uh, curved in uh, different directions uh, during that uh, time period. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? All right, so... Um, we already talked about kind of the rebates where you would charge one person one price and then a different person a different price. And you can see uh, people like Jay Gould on, on the leg, according to this Vanderbilt here, who were uh, kind of controlling the railroads and uh, fixing uh, prices, which led to a lot of problems with the farmers because a lot of farmers were the ones that had to they they would uh, bring their products to uh, railroad towns. They had nowhere to store them. Well, of course, you know, you could rent out, you know, silos or whatnot, but they had to pay an enormous price for those things to be stored, be stored and they pay probably a, a, a high price for for even the use of the railroads. And so it was really uh, a disadvantage for uh, farmers, uh, which led to the Granger movement. I'm not going to get a whole lot into the Granger movement because I'm going to save that for the next video. When we talk about uh, populism. All right. So. As a result, you see a decline of American agriculture because farmers were not making money. So a lot of them leave the farms and move to the cities to look for for jobs. And you kind of see this as a as a continuity throughout our history is the uh, con- continual uh, uh, ignoring of the uh, of the American farmer. 
Um, another uh, example of a captive industry would be Andrew Carnegie. Uh, a lot of times people in society pronounce him Carnegie, but it was Carnegie uh, and the Steel Corporation. And uh, I think there's a uh, there should be a picture that kind of looks at what vertical integration is, but he's going to own every aspect of production, going from buying the land, mining the iron, going through the Bessemer steel process, and uh, and creating the final uh, steel product. Now, of course, with what's the impact of steel is that skyscrapers can build north because of the steel rebar, and then, of course, railroads become more durable because uh, steel is more durable. Uh, so this will lead to the urbanization of cities. Uh, he also believed in a thing called the uh, gospel of wealth. And the gospel of, we of wealth was coined in 1892, where the where he uh, where millionaires came from well-to-do backgrounds, and they made fortunes from new industries, and they were pretty much politically conservative. And so they defended the status quo and were against government interference in the economy. And so Herbert Spencer from England is going to introduce social Darwin. Darwinism or this gospel of, uh, of wealth uh, concept to America. This was a philosophy which apologized for the competitiveness and greed of American capitalists. Its American spokesman was a guy by the name of Professor William Graham Sumner, who was opposed to both protectionism and, um, and imperialism. So the parts of the gospel of wealth theory is where the American uh, economy is controlled for the benefit of all by a natural aristoc aristocracy brought uh, to brought to the top uh, by competition. So the, the survival of the fittest in the business world. Uh, politicians can't be trusted like businessmen because they were not subject to natural uh, selection. The government cannot interfere with the economy as it would uh, upset natural selection. The slums and poverty were natural, yet negative results of competition in government should not try to eliminate them. And then, of course, the rich are obliged, however, to try and correct those social injustices. And uh, this is a reinforcement of the 14th Amendment and the due process of law uh, from a corporate interest. So the 14th Amendment can be interpreted not only from a, a human perspective, but also from a, a, from a corporate uh, perspective. Um, so going on with kind of the Bessemer uh, with, uh, with Andrew Carnegie, we're talking about the Bessemer process where you take iron ore, uh, you know, melt it down, uh, fuse it with oxygen and you create this durable steel which is going to allow uh, the supply of steel to uh, increase and so the prices are going to drop and the abundance of steel will help the uh, industrial growth and expansion of the United States. And so here you see a little chart of, uh, of steel production going up into the 1915. Of course, this is going to take place around the Ohio Lakes uh, area in Michigan. And of course, that's where the steel, uh, where the Ford Corporation is, but that's also known as the Rust Belt. Uh, of the United States. Oh, there we go. Here's a map. So you can see this map uh, and where most of the most of the coal and iron is located in the United States. And of course, businesses are going to thrive in that area. And so anytime that elections come up and they start talking about job opportunities, this is the area that is focused on because these are the factory workers that that work in these and these factories. They want these factories to stay open and create uh, work. Uh, and so going back to vertical inter integration and monopoly, purchase and acquire all aspects of production. And so here you see from the from the uh, coke fields that were uh, uh, purchased by Carnegie uh, to the uh, the uh, extraction of the mineral uh, iron ore, uh, putting them in steel mills, putting them on ships, and then of course sending them through railroads. Carnegie owns every aspect of it, and that's vertical uh, integration from ground to uh, to selling. And so here's kind of how the skyscrapers, how you know. In New York City in 1850, and then looking at 1900, and of course you've seen pictures of it today. Dominated the skyline is dominated with uh, with uh, skyscrapers. Uh, it's going to help the urban infrastructure, uh, things like the Brooklyn Bridge, George Washington Bridge, Grand Central Station, and uh, it's going to lead to urban uh, innovation like subway cars, elevated cars, cable cars, especially in the Chicago as far as the elevated rails, elevators. Uh, and then uh, and then heating systems uh, in the in the north especially, and so you see that a lot of people you can see urbanization as skyscrapers are building upward, people are being more attracted to the cities. So you can see 123 percent increase of people moving to Chicago in 30 years. You can see Los Angeles is a quickly growing uh, growing country, uh, growing city as well as look at Seattle, all right, located on the west coast as well. Um, as far as uh, labor is concerned, of course, the average worker is going to work anywhere from about 60 hours a week paid at about 10 cents 
uh, an hour, which of course compared, of course, today we have minimum wage that would uh, take care of that, but there was no minimum wage back then. So obviously they, uh, they suffered, um, you know, the blue collar worker adjustment to machine and factory life in, in America, it was very painful and it was very, uh, very difficult. Uh, some of the problems they had poor working conditions, long hours, low pay, uh, lack of safety. Uh, there was no, uh, personal relationship between, uh, the worker and the owners, uh, you know, in the 1870s, you have the mix of blacks and new immigrants from southern eastern Europe. In the 1890s, you see married women uh, start to work as families begin to size down and work is uh, somewhat easier due to the new inventions. And then, of course, the loss of status as they were the mostly unskilled workers with little independence and they were hard to take, hard to take pride in uh, in assembly line uh, work. And so this is going to lead to uh, the emergence of labor unions and child labor laws. Uh, you know some of the some of the causes of uh, of labor unions. Uh, they wanted to uh, address poor and dangerous working conditions. They wanted uh, protection, especially uh, immigrants. And so some of the popular labor unions that were created uh, during this time: National Labor Union, the Knights of Labor, which you need to know, uh, founded by Uriah Stevens, uh, headed by William uh, Powderly who will uh, lead the Knights of Labor, uh, the American Federation of Labor, created by Samuel Gompers, make sure you know who he is, and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, otherwise it's the CIO. The American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations are the two labor organizations that exist today, and they are actually fused into one labor union called the CIO and AFL, uh, and they exist to this day. I believe that happened in 1979, I believe. Uh, but you have uh, all kinds of labor unions. And the problem with labor unions is they were kind of seen as uh, terrorists, uh, a lot of domestic terrorism that occurred because of labor unions. And a lot of them will see as socialists. And you'll see the Socialist Party will emerge in the in the rise of labor unions. Remember, socialism at its core is giving the giving the workers uh, power over those uh, business leaders. And so, however, when it's practiced in society, you see like Russia and or the USSR, North Korea, and how communism is used uh, in the world. Um, some of the rationales uh, when it comes to labor unions is that the capitalists took financial risk. They were provided labor opportunities. They expanded the economy. Um, however, uh, they're going to use different uh, tactics in order to kind of fend against labor unions, uh, things like lockouts. They would hire scabs, which were replacements. And the thing about uh you know, no protection is that if you break your, if you break your arm, you're not getting workers comp. You're going to get fired. You're going to get replaced by somebody who's willing to work for cheaper and for longer hours. And that was the incentive about immigrants coming into the United States is those immigrants, uh, they were desperate for work and they were willing to work for a lower wage. African-Americans that escaped slavery or they are now free of slavery. They're going to come to the North and they're looking to, uh, you know, they're going to hire the person who's willing to work for, uh, for the cheapest. The Knights of Labor, like I said, uh, founded by uh, Terrence Powderly. Uh, there was a uh, incident um, in uh, uh, in Chicago where a uh, Haymarket Square riot, where a bomb went off, killing several, uh, several people at the riot. And so from there, you, not only did you see the Knights of Labor disappear, but this is where you see the, uh, you kind of see the correlation between labor unions as uh, anarchists. Uh, the Great Railroad Strike in 1877 is also a popular one. Um, where um, governor, the president actually had to intervene uh, to avoid things like insurrections, and he actually uses federal troops uh, to suppress it. Here's the Haymarket riot of uh, of 1866, which is uh, where a pipe bomb is going to go off and kill uh, kill seven kill seven police officers, and uh, eight are going to end up dying because of police firing. Um, and the impact is, is that they were criticized for their use of violence. And that's going to weaken their impact uh, in society. The American Federation of Labor is alive and well today. Uh, they pro they wanted higher wages and eight-hour workday. They wanted safer working conditions and child labor laws. Uh, they were uh, a group of skilled workers, so they didn't necessarily uh, join with uh, industrial unions. They did not want women. They did not want minorities or uh, foreign labor. Uh, the Homestead strike happened in 1892. Uh, Henry Frick, who was the manager of Car uh, Carnegie Skill, is going to try to lock uh, people out. He's going to actually hire a group of uh, private detectives known as Pinkertons. 
at the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And uh, basically what happens is you have a... Um, uh, you basically have a violence that occurs outside the steel corporation in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, he orders the lockout, the, uh, the state militia ends up having to, to uh, break up the strike and uh, the union is uh, broken as a result. Uh, the Pullman strike in 1894 was a group of uh, P- uh, Pullman Palace. They made palace cars, which were luxury cars, uh, on the railroads. And they decided to, uh, cease work, try to block. Uh, the railroads, and actually what ended up happening is because the uh, U.S. mail was pushed along in Pullman cars, uh, Grover Cleveland actually had to intervene because to halt the stop of U.S. mail was a uh, was a, was a federal crime, and so they had to uh, and so they had to cease on their uh, on their strikes as well. Um, like I said, yeah. So they had Grover Cleveland dispatch troops to break up the strike. He says, if it takes an entire army and navy of the United States to deliver a postcard to Chicago, that card will be delivered. Strikers are going to overturn and burn rail cars and engage in the National Guards. Twenty-six civilians are going to kill uh, are going to be killed in a riot. And once again, it feeds into that notion that labor union workers are nothing but uh, violent terrorists. All right. So here's where you see the major strikes occurred. Notice it's up in the Ohio, Ohio River Valley along the, along the Great Lakes where a lot of those industries are going to uh, thrive. And so here you see the growth of unions. Uh, now, unions later on, of course, will, you know, they, they thrive in America in some way. And there's a lot of benefits to it, uh, you know, but um make sure you keep uh, make sure you keep the continuity straight. That they want to lower higher pay, and lower hours uh, versus that. <clears throat> I'll let you at any time you can stop and, and read these. Uh, some of these we'll go over in class. All right. So uh, the next uh, entrepreneur is John D. Rockefeller, who's known for standard oil and horizontal integration, which, of course, is taking businesses that are alike. So imagine taking all the oil companies that exist in the U.S. and merging them into one monopoly. And he calls it standard oil. Um, and here's where you start to see the government try to strike back against um against uh, trust and monopolies through the Sherman Antitrust Act in uh, 1890. And basically it was to try to uh, try to limit um, uh, businesses and, and monopolies from thriving uh, in the United States. We well, actually makes it illegal. But the problem is, is when do you actually, uh, when do you actually, how do you actually enforce it? So uh, things to think about on that aspect. All right. So here are some pictures of vertical integration versus horizontal integration. Um, you know, on the left would be what Carnegie would use. On the right would be what uh, Rockefeller would use to uh, create their monopolies. Here's some here's some terminology as far as what a trust is. I always say a trust and a monopoly are almost the same thing. Holding company is a company formed to purchase and own as controlling stock in several different companies. The Yum Corporation would be an example of that. I don't know if you noticed, but Yum uh, owns Taco Bell, KFC. Long John Silver, Sarah Lee, even Nike is part of the uh, part of the Yum uh, Corporation. Um, of course, Standard Oil Trust. There's a lot of uh, a lot of political cartoons out there that'll um, that'll basically say that the government is uh, at the mercy of these uh, of these trusts. And so here you see uh, what we call um, I think it's called Next, uh, using uh, the octopus as uh, as Standard Oil. Uh, here's another one of Standard Oil. Here's more on the Sherman Antitrust Act. It was very vague. It wasn't until 1917 when it was enforced, reinforced, 1914, I'm sorry, when it was reinforced with the Clayton Antitrust Act, which refined the terms monopoly and trust, as mentioned in the Sherman uh, Sherman Act, and made it enforceable, along with the leadership of Theodore Roosevelt during that time. Here's a political cartoon called The Bosses of the Senate, and you notice the guys on the top are your, are your uh, trust organizers, and they all uh, are standing over kind of these guys working in Congress and you can kind of see uh, interest from monopolists up here at the top. You can see, you know, uh, uh, this is, this is a Senate of uh, monopolists and they're the ones that are going to control, you know, their standard oil right there in the middle. Uh, they, uh, they're the ones that are controlling what's going on in the government. <laughs> This is Rockefeller, and it's called What a Funny Little Government. Actually, Washington is seen by trust, and you can see him manipulate, manipulating the uh, uh, congressional members in the White House and the Capitol off in the distance and smokestacks. Uh, here are some uh, Supreme Court rulings. I'm not going to get into them a whole lot. Um, you know, 
Uh, of course, Wabash versus Illinois is where it establishes the Interstate Commerce Act, which regulates the railroads. And like I said, the other ones you can kind of read up on and look up on your own. All right, uh, J.P. Morgan is uh, as a banking uh, is uh, is kind of holds a, a power in the banking industry, um, and he will later buy um, the U.S. Steel Corporation from uh, from Carnegie. Oh, I'm sorry, he buys Carnegie Steel and turns it into the U.S. Steel uh, Corporation. And here's some we've already talked about: General Electric, U.S. Steel. Uh, created from Steel, the American Telephone and Telegraph Corporation that you know as AT&T was a J.P. Morgan Company uh, merger of, uh, of Alexander Graham Bell and communication companies. And so you can see the corporate mergers, how they spike in 1900. And then as the uh, Sherman Antitrust Act is enforced, you can see that number uh, dwindling down. All right. So also during this time is a time where consumerism is going to become uh, popular, where now you are not necessarily buying for what you need, but you are buying for what you want. And so with that, you have department stores like Macy's that's going to be uh, founded during uh, during the Gilded Age, Woolsworth, which isn't necessarily as popular as it used to be, uh, mail order catalogs from Sears. Uh, uh, Sears Roebuck, Montgomery Ward, J.C. Penney's, because as people move out to the West, they are going to buy their supplies from the East. So they get a catalog, they order it, they telegraph it in, they pay for it, they uh, and then they bring uh, that product out on the uh, on the railroad, and they can pick it up uh, after the nearest uh, railroad town. Of course, so we've already talked about Dr. Pepper, Wrigley Gum. Uh, toasted cornflakes. So a lot of these, you know, it's always fun to kind of go and, and uh, research these products that have been around for so long and actually where they came from. And some of these are one of the more ones, more of the ones, stable ones that have been around for a very, very long time. All right. So we're going to transition over here to politics and the economy uh, of the Gilded Age. And so what do I want you to think about? Evaluate the beliefs and debates of the federal government's role and policies for economic and social issues. So really, we're now we're getting into kind of the political uh, aspect of it. Um, and so as, as, uh, we head into life without Abraham Lincoln there, there introduces the third party system. And so if you remember from the Democrat democratic party, these are your old Southern Democrats, uh, that believed in slavery. And so they're not necessarily for the advancement of, uh, African Americans, uh, in Europe. Uh, they are uh, wanting to redeem the South for themselves, and at the same time, they're kind of creating the New South as well. The Republicans, uh, they are for radical reconstruction. We already know this. They break up into three faction, factions. I'm sorry. Uh, they Star Wars, Half Breeds, and Mugwumps, and they're a coalition of basically what we called your WASP, the White Anglo-Saxon Protestants uh, from the Northwest and the uh, and the East. Uh, immigrants, of course, when they get when they get off the ship, they're going to encounter uh, political machines and political bosses. The most notorious one is William Boss Tweed out of Tammany Hall in New York City, and basically they uh, they help the immigrants find work. Uh, this is good work because it helps build the infrastructure of these towns and cities and at this building streets and building, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, buildings and such. And, and so as a, as a result, they're going to give up their vote and they're going to make sure that they vote the same way because you can see this guy here and all these are drawn by Thomas Nast. And that's the beauty of Thomas Nast. And we've talked about him before is he's going to expose these political cartoons and it's almost like our expose uh, William Tweed. And it's going to be a call to action to congressional members and he'll eventually be arrested and put into jail. But uh, for a long time, they just stand at the ballot box and make sure that these immigrants were voting the way that would benefit the uh, political boss. All right. So Ulysses S. Grant is elected in, uh, in 1868 and we know that he uses the bloody shirt uh, campaign where he, he kind of uses his uh, claim to fame as in the uh, Civil War uh, because he was a Civil War hero. He was a great soldier, but he had no political experience. Uh, the, all the Democrats could do is they could denounce military reconstruction. They couldn't agree on anything else. They are very, very disorganized. The Republicans got Grant to uh, elected using that bloody shirt campaign, reliving the war victories, and uh, and due to the close nature of the election, uh, the Republicans could not take uh take future victories for granted. Uh, during this time, presidency, like I said, a lot of uh, scandals that happened during that time, the the Tammany Hall tweed ring was one of those things that uh, employed bribery, graft, fake elections to cheat the city with as much as $200 million. Amongst those also was the, uh, 
was the, where the uh, the whiskey ring and then also the credit mobilier uh, scandal where it's people were pocketing money. Uh, even um, Grant's uh, brother-in-law was in on the action where um, stealing gold from, from the United States. Uh, unfortunately for Grant, he was an easygoing feller. He apparently failed to see the corruption going on. Like I said, the Credit Mobilier was a railroad con- construction company, paid itself huge sums of money for small railroad construction. The Whiskey Ring robbed millions, uh, Treasury millions of dollars when Grant's own private secretary was one of the criminals. So like I said, not one of the greatest uh, presidents because of all the scandal that uh, surrounded him. Uh, he will be reelected in uh, 1872. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party is going to put up a guy by the name of Forrest Greeley uh, out of uh, out of New York, I believe. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. All right. So this leads to the panic of uh, 1837. This was kind of the first major uh, uh, depression in the United States. Why? What caused it? Too many railroads and factories being formed that existing in the markets could bear and the overloading of banks of those projects. Essentially, the causes of the panic were the same old ones that caused recession every 20 years of that century. Overspeculation of businesses and too easy credit. And when people can't pay back their credit, the bank's going to take a hit. When the banks take a hit, they're not able to give out loans. And when they're not able to give out loans, businesses are going to fail. People are going to get fired. Then they don't have money. Uh, it started with the with the failure of the New York banking firm, Jay Cook & Company, which was headed by Jay Cook who was a financer during the Civil War. Uh, Before the greenbacks had been used in the Civil War, were now being recalled, but now during the panic, the cheap money supporters wanted greenbacks to be printed in mass again. That that would increase inflation. Supporters of hard money, which was actual gold and silver, persuaded Grant to veto a bill that would print more paper money, and the Resumption Act of 1875 pledged the government to further withdraw greenbacks and make all further redemption of money in gold at face value starting in 1879. Um, debtors now cried that silver was undervalued. They called for inflation, but Grant refused to coin more silver dollars, which was stopped in 1873. Uh, Grant's name remains fused to sound money. That's why he's on the $10 bill, though it's not a sound though not sound government. As greenbacks regained their value, free greenback holders bothered to exchange their uh, convenient bills for gold when the redemption day came in 1879. Uh, the Republicans are have a hard money policy. Unfortunately for it, led to the election of a Democratic House of Representatives in 1874 and then the Labor Party in 1878. So uh, you can kind of see anytime there's a repression, uh, railroads and businesses are, are going to fail. All right. So in the election of 1876, we have... Um, of course, Rutherford B. Hayes that becomes president, and we know that that's because there was a tie in the Electoral College. They end up giving Hayes the election in order for uh, Hayes to uh, call off Reconstruction. So here's more information on the Compromise of 1877. We've already discussed that, so we're not going to get into that again. The election of 1880, you see a guy by the name of James Garfield, uh, a man from Ohio who had risen to, to the rank of major general in the Civil War, and his running mate, who was a notorious stalwart or a supporter of Roster Conkling, was chosen, which was Chester A. Author of New York. Um, the campaign was uh, avoided touchy issues, and Garfield squeaked in the, in the popular vote. And actually, he wasn't even considered a major uh, candidate until the nominating uh, convention uh, happened. He gave a rounding speech in support of uh, of, uh, of uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who was seeking re-election, and the uh, Republicans fell in love with Garfield, and he ends up becoming uh, president. Um, he wasn't necessarily a strong president. He named James B. Blaine to the position of Secretary of State, uh, and he made other anti-Stalwart acts, uh, but he died after being shot. He, he, uh, he actually lived for about two, I think two months after, his, uh, uh, after he was shot in the back, uh, by a guy by the name of Charles Guiteau, who had, uh, after being captured, uh, used the early version of the insanity defense to avoid the conviction. So anytime the president dies in office, the vice president is going to become uh, president, and that is Chester A. Arthur. All right? And what Chester A. Arthur is known for is uh, the Pendleton Act of 1883, 
or what we call the Magna Carta of Civil Service Reform, which was which is the awarding of government jobs based on the ability, not just because the buddy of a buddy awarded the job. If you remember the spoil system from um, Andrew Jackson, uh, he's going to prohibit financial assessments on job holders and establish a merit system of making appointments to office on the basis of aptitude rather than pull. He'll set up the Civil Service Commission that charged with administering uh, open competitive service and offices not classified by the president remain the fought over uh, footballs of politics. Uh, Arthur will cooperate, and by 1884, he had classified nearly 10% of all federal offices, uh, or nearly 14,000 uh, of them. Uh, the Pendleton Act is going to uh, partially divide the politics from patronage and draw politicians from the marriages of convenience with business uh, leaders. He didn't seem a very good fit for presidency, but many were surprised by the advancements that he was able to uh, make. Um, also during that time period, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese will become the only group of people in American history that will actually have a law that excludes their immigration into the United States, uh, which will, won't really be overturned until after World War I. Um, in the election of 1884, you see uh, Grover Cleveland, who is the only president to be elected at two different uh two non-consecutive times um he the democrats are going to choose grover cleveland as their candidate they received a shock when it was revealed that he might have be the father of an illegitimate child and of course they use that as most slinging the campaign in 1884 was filled with perhaps the lowest mode slinging in american history Believe it or not, the contest depended on how uh, New York chose, but unfortunately, one foolish Republican insulted the fa race, faith, and patriotism of New York's heavy Irish population, and as a result, New York voted for Cleveland, and Cleveland becomes the president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. He was the first Democratic president since James Buchanan before the Civil War to become president of the United States. He was a supporter of laissez-faire capitalism, and he was uh, delighted uh, he was delighted business owners and bankers. He named two former Confederates to his cabinet and tried to adhere to the merit system, but but eventually gave in to his party, fired nearly two-thirds of the 12, 120,000 employees. Uh, but he had a lot of his, but he had his own share of problems, things like military pensions. Uh, these bills were given to Civil War veterans to help them, but they were fraudulent, used fraudulent to give money uh, to all sports people. Uh, however, Cleveland showed that he was ready to take uh, take on the corrupt uh, distributors of military pension. And with any president, you got to weigh the good with the bad as far as what they were successful in and what they were not. Another thing that Cleveland uh, problem with is he had a surplus of $145 million in 1881. Most of it had come from the high tariff, and there was a lot of clamoring to lower the tariff. But, of course, big industrialists are going to oppose it because, remember, high tariff means to uh, in, to encourage domestic um, production. Um, he wasn't really interested in the subject at first, but he researched it and became inclined to lower the tariff in 1887, and he openly uh, tossed the appeal for a lower tariff to, to, to the lap of Congress. Uh, Democrats were upset by the way their uh, president handled it, while the Republicans gloated that this was a reckless act. And this, of course, will lead to the election of Benjamin Harrison, just rolling through these presidents. Now, like I said, these aren't the who's who of presidents. Um, Benjamin Harrison... Uh, uh, will become the first. Will become the uh, will become president when the, the congressional budget will hit one billion dollars. It was nicknamed the billion dollar Congress. Um, choo -choo -choo, what else on? Oh, wait, here it is. To solve the problem of reaching a quorum in Congress, the Speaker of the House by the name of Thomas Reed uh, was a very very smart man. Counted, uh, recounted the Democrats who were present yet didn't answer. To the roll call, and after three days of chaos, he finally prevailed, opening the 51st or billion dollar Congress, one that legislated many uh, expensive products. And this will also lead to the uh, emergence of the Populist Party during 1892. Like, like I said, we'll start in the next uh, uh, next video. My medalism, I'll cover in the next uh, in the next one because farmers were the ones that were clamoring for uh, silver to enter the uh, enter the be back by money. 1892, we go back to Grover Cleveland. Uh, he wins, but no sooner that he had stepped into the presidency than the Depression of 1893 break out, and it was the first such panic in a new urban industrial age caused much of outrage and hardships. 
and it completed the almost uh, predictable every 20 year cycle of panics during the panic. So if you think of our panics, they happen about every 20 years or so. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, 800 businesses are going to collapse in six months. Dozens of railroad lines went into the, into the hands of uh, the of the receivers. Um, he at this time uh, Cleveland had a deficit and a problem for the treasury had to issue gold for the notes that had been paid in the Sherman Silver Purchases Act and according to law those notes had to be reissued and so we'll go on the gold standard from this point meanwhile Grover Cleveland developed a malignant growth under the roof of his mouth he had secretly removed to the surgery that took place aboard his private yacht and had he died Adelaide Stevenson, who was a person of soft money, would have um, it would have caused massive chaos and inflation. Um, and also, this is going to lead to, like I said, the Populist Party merging with the Democratic Party. And you see, uh, you'll see the, to the likes of uh, William Jenny Bryan, who will become more popular in the, pop, the poverty movement. And then, as the Americans start to appeal towards imperialism, uh, young William McKinley will uh, become synonymous in 1896 as well. So here's some more things on the uh, 18 the panic of 1893 railroad speculation over expansion the silver purchase act that was re repealed unemployment rate was up to 18.4 percent Coxey's army which was a march on Washington by unemployed workers and farmers um, and there's a lot of correlation between uh, the populist movement and the movie The Wizard of Oz which we'll get into uh, in class uh, which will lead to the election of 1896 and William McKinley. All right. And that's kind of the end of our show. So um, take time to make sure that you read through chapter 17 and through uh, chapter 18. Um, and uh, we'll see you hopefully see you next time.